One of the interesting things recently was looking back at a predictions table from last year. There was a guy on Twitter, a small Twitter account, who started to keep a track of predictions, and he put them on a WordPress site. And, you know, if you made a big prediction and you got it right, you'd get a lot of points. Small prediction, you got right a small amount of points and get a prediction wrong, you lose points. And he totted up everyone's predictions from, you know, Ann Coulter to Dave Rubin to Bernie Sanders to more dissenting top um, type voices like myself. And it was quite interesting looking back. I mean, one of the reasons I was uh, became so interested in it is uh, I was vying for top place. And, you know, unfortunately, he discontinued it around the time of the election, because I think if he totted up the election predictions, I would have ended up in first place. But what was interesting looking back was that you realize that things seem so much more important uh, at the time that they're happening, which is maybe kind of an obvious observation. But, you know, one of the, I think the only prediction I had wrong was that there'd be a minute silence for George Floyd at the first presidential debate, which seemed very realistic at the time, but even a, a month after that um, seemed very unlikely. And I'm not the worst offender. I mean, there were so many predictions about civil war, about an uprising um, during the, the riots in the summer. And then you think back at it and you look at the year and you think, well, you know, at the start of the year, 2020, with the Iran strike and people were talking about World War Three, And then when the uh, the next crisis came along, everyone started, you know, talking about the, the China virus and people were saying that, um, you know, that the death toll was being hidden and it was actually like tens of millions of dead bodies in China and all this kind of thing. And it was going to be the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu. And um, it was a bioweapon that was going to kill tens of millions of people. People were saying all this kind of thing. And then you come along to the BLM riots and people are saying this is civil war, this is an uprising, um, this is the end of America, this is collapse, uh, this can't go on, the only way this can end in is conflict, there's no way that they can just get these people to stop rioting now, if they send the police after them it's going to escalate, uh, people are going to form militias, they're going to fight back, all of this kind of thing. And you get to October and those riots are kind of forgotten about. And then you have the election. And, you know, I remember doing a poll on my Twitter account where I asked people who would be president in January. And this was like two weeks after the election result came in. And even then, even then you had the majority of people uh, thought that Trump would be inaugurated president on January, even knowing that the whole... Uh, you know, that none of the establishment is on his side, that somehow, some way, through, uh, through the power of, of lots of angry Trump supporters, that he would uh, become president. Um, but you realize this, and you realize that especially the talk of, of collapse, of civil war, of a popular revolution, is very common in, in the right. It's very common among right-wing populists. Sometimes they'll do it saying, well, I don't want it, obviously, I'm not advocating it, but how else can this end, you know? And this is like a very sort of popular way of discussing right-wing politics, especially on YouTube. The case in point is Tim Pool. He has something like 28 videos on his YouTube channel about civil war. And he had a video up recently on the book The Fourth Turning, which is all about historical cycles, um, how there are certain uh, generational types that repeat throughout history, sort of archetypal generations and how the interplay of these generations create patterns of events. Um, you know, that there's sort of a winter and summer of civilization and that you can kind of trace when there's going to be a major um, conflict that will usher in a new cycle, all this kind of thing. So, you know, he has a guy explaining this book and it's always kind of the same thing with these videos. He gets some guy on to summarize an article or a book and he's like, oh, this is what I've been saying. This is uh, proof that we're heading for civil war. You know, he has all these videos where it's like he's going to quote one article where it quotes a professor and a professor says that America is headed for a cold civil war. And Tim Pool is like, well, this is exactly what I've been saying. And his argument is always the same. People are really angry. Uh, you know, America is the 
uh, disunited States of America, the divided States of America, and civil war must be inevitable, says Tim Pool, because people are really mad at each other, and polarization is getting worse, and the Democrats hate the Republicans, and the Republicans hate the Democrats. And this is the very sort of basic um, right-wing populist take on political conflict, on civil war, on where things are headed. And it's always basically this formula of people get really mad at each other. There's a lot of polarization. People get very cynical about politics. And then somehow, some way, you know, people take up arms and they take to the streets and I guess they pick sides and suddenly you're in a civil war. Um, you know, the most powerful empire the world has ever seen really in, in scope and power. It just descends into civil war because people get really mad about partisan politics. This is kind of how Tim Pool explains it. Um, but I mean, this, it's not just limited to this kind of thing either. I mean, I did a poll on, on Twitter actually after the election, and this I think this was like two weeks after the election result, and it was like, who will be president? Who will be inaugurated president in January? And the majority of people said Donald Trump. Um, now, you can think what you want about the election, but I think by the time we got around to December, uh, the likelihood that Trump was going to overturn this stuff was, was pretty low. But again, you saw this logic with the Capitol Hill riot. Um, you saw this logic with the whole way the election narrative was approached, which was, again, it was this thing of our path to victory is we're going to make conservatives uh, really blackpilled we're going to show them that democracy is a fraud and then, uh, again, the polarization is going to get so bad, people are going to lose so much faith in the institutions that, again, it's just going to descend into this kind of conflict or there'll be a coup of some kind and there'll be, um, you know, the installing of some new regime. But it always tends to follow this pattern. Now, I didn't buy that narrative anyway because... I mean, I think polarization is such that regardless of who wins an election in the U.S. now, it's going to be deemed illegitimate by the other side. Anyway, I've said that for months leading up to the election. Whoever wins, the other side isn't going to accept it. You know, you can talk about election integrity and all this stuff, but at the end of the day, if Trump won, the Democrats would have considered it illegitimate because he's a neo-fascist, because he used racism to get elected, because uh, even if he won the popular vote, it's never acceptable to kind of uh, oppress minority groups, uh, even if the majority group votes for it, all this kind of thing. The same kind of things we heard in 2016 that say Russia was involved, um, or that say he didn't win the popular vote, so therefore he shouldn't be president. If Biden won, you know, you can look at the collusion of mainstream media, you can look at the collusion of big tech and silence and Trump supporters, all these kinds of things. So, I mean, I think the, you know, the meme that people are going to realize uh, something about the integrity of the electoral system, and that's going to be what pushes America over the edge. I think that's very misguided too. But again, all of these things, it's this idea that there's kind of a certain level of cynicism, there's a certain level of anger, there's a certain level of polarization that keeps getting worse and worse. And past that point, conflict is inevitable. But none of this stuff really is is borne out by what if you just look at look at what is happening structurally. I mean, yes, you can look at the news events and you're constantly seeing uh, racial strife and um, partisan politics getting more and more vicious and cancel culture and all this stuff. But if you just look, you know, structurally, uh, if you look at how the elites are doing, I mean, America is doing quite well for the people it's meant to serve. And it's this very sort of liberal view of conflict that civil war, that these big political conflicts as this kind of spontaneous self-organizing thing where individuals um, come together and they each have grievances from what they've been seeing in the news and uh, they sort of spontaneously form these groups take, capable of, of taking down the state. And what all this is missing is, I mean, there is no... There is no elite that is interested in a civil conflict in the US. There is no elite on the side of the populist right. I mean, there is a, there is a certain 
appetite maybe among some uh, billionaires for a kind of populist right. But I mean, the kind of populist right they're interested in isn't, um, you know, angry boomers going out with assault rifles. Um, it's much more milk toast than that. But I mean, if you look at, you know, you can look at conflicts through history and you can think of, you know, what's a, what's a case study that you look for something like this? And in almost every case of a civil war and almost every case of a major social upheaval like that, you have two uh, different elite factions that become sort of fundamentally incompatible. It becomes worth the bargain of an outright um, violent conflict for one of these factions to make that move. And often what this is uh, preceded by is some kind of big economic upheaval or some kind of big uh, sort of geopolitical pressure. Um, you can look at something like the Russian Revolution. And again, this is where the left will look at the growth of right-wing populism and they'll do this very kind of uh, juvenilian analysis. They'll say right-wing populism is a phenomenon of billionaires see that the working class are becoming resentful against their rule. Um, they want economic reforms. And so what the billionaires do in that case is they fund right-wing demagogues that will tell the people, uh, your problem isn't the class structure, your problem isn't us, the wealthy elite, your problem isn't that you're being exploited. The problem is uh, the immigrants, or the problem is uh, whatever minority group, and that this is a way for the elites to use populism to maintain and expand their control. Uh, of course, they never put this lens back on the left, but you look at what is the classic leftist revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, and you look at that as a, a case study, and I mean, you have a few things here. First of all, you know, obviously Russia is in a war at the time, the Great War, so obviously there's immense, um, you know, geopolitical pressure, uh, you know, the existence of, of the state is at risk. So straight away you have, when you're under that kind of pressure, you have uh, the people on the home front, you have an elite that is uh, becoming more aware of, of the potential of uh, a complete loss of, of their wealth and power, a complete capitulation. But you have serious elite interests here. You know, you have people like Lenin and Trotsky were funded from the beginning by Wall Street bankers, and this is kind of well documented now. You know, bankers like the Warburgs on, on Wall Street that funded the Bolsheviks. Even after the revolution, you have huge uh, American industrialists that make huge money, do huge business with um, Russia under Lenin and Stalin, uh, more so than they ever did with the Tsar, because of course the, the communists industrialized Russia and Henry Ford builds tractor factories in Russia. What you also have, which gets less discussed is, you know, Lenin was sent to Russia on a train of full of uh, communist agitators that was paid for by German intelligence. When Lenin got to Russia, when he got to what's now said Petersburg, you know, German military uh, intelligence officer sent to communicate to the Kaiser telling them that uh, everything was going planned, uh, everything was going as planned in Russia with Lenin and the Bolsheviks. So, I mean, right the way through this, you have elite support, you have incentives for elites to overthrow the Tsar, and it's really no different anywhere you look. I mean, all of these uh, supposed spontaneous uh, civil conflicts, there's always this sort of structural change that incentivizes the new elite to grab power, or there's some kind of outside um, geopolitical influence, uh, war, uh, funding by outside interests. And none of this is applicable to America. Uh, when you look back at it, I mean, I think the, probably the most, you know, if you're to try and think of the most populist revolution, the best example of, of a grassroots popu uh, popular revolution, I mean, I think Cuba is a good example, but even Cuba, um, you know, they had funding from uh, people that had fled Batista's regime. Um, but probably the best examples would be that, uh, the Chinese Revolution, the Communist Revolution, but again, there'd just been a war with Japan, and wars and conflicts tend to really shake up uh, the structure of the elite. It tends to really shake things up, and it, it allows... Um, 
uh, kind of rapid change in, in leadership. Um, but maybe the best example, I think, is the Iranian Revolution. And it's an interesting case, actually, because you know, I talked to Chris Bond recently. He mentioned this Marxist theorist, uh, Tita Scottpol, who has this kind of structural analysis of, of revolutions and analyzes revolutions not from this um, sort of individualist or uh, psychological understanding, but takes this very structural look and says that this is due to structural changes in the state and so on. Um, it's this very state-driven thing, um, a very sort of hard-headed materialist analysis. But Scottwell actually acknowledged that the Iranian revolution kind of falsified her own theory and that it is uh, as close as you get to kind of a genuine populist revolution. But what you find with something like Cuba, what you find with something like um, Iran, and what you find with China is that each of them is less a case of some big powerful elite bankrolling all this stuff, funding all this stuff, pulling the strings. Um, they are more populist. But what you find with all of them is this common factor where you don't find revolutions in very traditional societies. Where you find them is where there's a lot of modernization going on. And basically the political system isn't able to keep up with the economic modernization and social modernization. And the scenario that seems to perfectly lead to this kind of uh, revolution is when you have a despot that's in charge of this stuff and is very slow to change and really isn't able to manage these kinds of transitions uh, at the proper pace. Uh, Batista is an example of that. And in the case of Batista and the Shad, they're both transparently puppets to the people at some stage. Uh, it's obvious to everyone that uh, the wealth of the country is being sent abroad, that the despot is doing a very bad job of managing the country, that a lot of groups are being left out in terms of uh, how prosperous they could be under a more competent regime. And what the common factor is, is that these despots fail to find a way to integrate new elites and aspirational elites. One of the interesting things about the Islamic Revolution is it had huge support from the middle class. The only group that really supported the Shah, interestingly enough, was the uh, industrial working class, which is, seems a bit surprising at first sight. But the Islamic Revolution had support from university graduates and had support from the middle class, had support from merchants, traders, craftsmen. And again, this was due to modernization. You know, the Shah managed it badly. He was uh, putting like these hundreds thousand year old uh, guild systems that operated in Iran with these tradesmen. He was putting them under pressure, bringing in new forms of economic modernization. Um, in the case of um, Cuba, uh, again, it's a very uh, sort of singular mode of production. Um, it's often been remarked that these revolutions happen more in like banana republics, as they call them, where there's like one main commodity export that the economy is reliant on. Uh, and so what you find is that when there's a wave of modernization and you have a despot that is very rigid in how they govern and unwilling to uh, integrate new elites into the system, uh, that then there's an incentive for everybody to get rid of this guy. No one's benefiting from this. Uh, there's lots of potentially wealthy and powerful people that see what is in their way. And so you do get a popular revolution in the case of uh, the Islamic Revolution. Now, of course, also you had the institutions of um, uh, the Islamic religion uh, that really perpetuated the stuff. You have the institutions of the guild systems and the bazaars and the... Uh, interconnectedness of, of the, the traders and the merchants and so on. So these are really old sort of subsidiary power systems uh, that were able to thrive. And again, this is where kind of the Shah failed to crack down enough on these power systems that were existing within his country. So the common factor in these cases, and these are the most popular cases you can find really of revolutions, 
most times civil war, civil conflict, in the case of, you know, look at the American Civil War, um, look at the American Revolution, what you have in those cases is just two completely different elites. It's two very fundamentally different ways of life, ways of uh, economic production. Uh, you have two elites that are reliant on very different kinds of, of economic production. You have one elite that if they lose that kind of economic production, if they lose that kind of, of governance, um, that they lose their wealth and power. And so they're going to fight tooth and nail uh, to segregate from that, to separate from that. Um, and when it's that irreconcilable, you're going to have conflict on the lower level and you're going to have civil war. So, I mean, that's the blueprint for a civil war. But the blueprint for a popular uprising, if you're to be more optimistic and say, well, OK, uh, there's no elite like there was in the time of the Civil War. There isn't this uh, sort of fundamentally different rural or industrial elite that's going to oppose the, the neoliberal merchant caste that governs the US. But maybe there'll be a popular revolution. Maybe there'll be something like the, you know, the Islamic Revolution or the, the Cuban Revolution or the Chinese Revolution. But again, the common factor in all of this is a big wave of modernization that the state isn't able, uh, isn't able to keep up with. And this isn't what you have in the US, because actually what you find with the US, if you're to look at it sort of coldly and, and just look at this kind of structurally, if you judge it by that metric of how well is it able to integrate um, new elites, aspirational elites, uh, the U.S. is actually quite good at this, and really economic liberalism and capitalism is really the best system for this in, in the way it's done in America. I mean, yes, the U.S. is an oligarchy, yes, the, the West in general is an oligarchy, but it's, you know, it's not an oligarchy of, of one elite that's kind of excluding other elite groups. You know, the, the Silicon Valley tech entrepreneurs aren't excluded by the Wall Street executives. The Wall Street executives aren't excluded by the old money, these old money families like the, the Rockefellers or uh, the Fords or the Mellons and so on. So there is a certain level of fluidity where it's able to, I mean, it's, it's not like the American dream where everyone can get rich, but there's a certain... Uh, there's a certain openness where it is able to integrate um, powerful people into the elite structure. Of course, the, now the problem is, you know, there isn't really fundamentally any difference of values with these people. And, you know, this is how the system functions. There's maybe a few thousand people uh, that control most of the banking industry, most of the insurance industry, um, the hedge funds. Uh, the big lobby organizations uh, that are the, the senators and the representatives um, that control the big media companies. And that's the, that's the root of the lead. And there's a remarkable uniformity of opinion. And there isn't like this cluster of an elite that are those people. And then there's some other big elite class that controls some hugely important industry of whatever kind that's completely kept out and separate. So the oligarchical structure is quite anti-fragile. It's quite able to integrate um, these new elites. And there isn't any big wave of modernization that's going to kind of sweep those elites away. You know, what you got with the French Revolution and the revolutions of the 18th century is you have the merchant class, you have the mercantile elite that got more and more powerful since the end of feudalism with the start of capitalism and... Um, you know, they, they become sort of international, they can leave Amsterdam for London and set up the, the Bank of England. And um, at the same time, you know, you have them existing alongside sort of feudal institutions, uh, feudal modes of production. And as the merchant class gathers power at a certain point, it's like, you know, the stuff really isn't necessary anymore. Do we really need these kings and nobles hanging around, do we really need all these uh, restrictions that are kind of leftovers from a bygone age? And the French Revolution was very much like that. It was the new elite class kind of just sweeping away the, the stuff that was no longer needed. This isn't what you have in the US. 
uh, the state is very much in keeping with elite interests. And when you see Black Lives Matter, when you see riots and protests, I mean, this isn't any, this isn't a sign of any fissure in the elite class. I mean, the entirety of of Black Lives Matter, you can look at where they're getting their funding from, and you know, Coca-Cola is funding Black Lives Matter, and all of these institutions, you know, the Open Society Foundation and the Ford Foundation, and all of these big companies, and there's uniform support for them among politicians, and Trump, when he was president, was uh, tweeting about the, the tragic death of George Floyd and all of this kind of stuff. So, I mean, the elite is in, is in complete agreement on this. I mean, the, the fissure, if you like, is largely imaginary. I mean, they're fighting something that's kind of elusive. They're fighting white supremacy. But again, there's no elite group that represents white supremacy. There's no one to be removed from power, really, because we know that that's basically leftist mythology that white supremacy is is somehow in power beneath the surface and none of this stuff was really harming them you know it seemed like people were logging on to twitter and there's riots every night and it's like wow this is this is chaotic we're watching the decline of an empire but i mean really what did it matter you know the stock market was still going up you get some broken windows you get some burned down cars but you know you have keynesian economics and you have uh, mmt and you know, who the hell cares, just uh, build more stuff, just fix up these buildings, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, at the same time, you know, you have police kind of standing back, letting this stuff happen. It wasn't like this was some big conflict where there was militias on the streets and the military police couldn't deal with them. No, it wasn't like that at all. You had the mayors in these uh, cities were basically telling the police to stand down. You had police chiefs were basically telling them to stand down. And... It was kind of a win-win situation for everyone, you know, the police allowed this stuff to happen and then the conservative politicians say the police need more funding, so, you know, the police get more funding and I guess the police chiefs are happy. Or, you know, you have the left saying that we have to abolish the police, which was uh, quite an absurd demand, but what do you get then? You have abolition of sort of local community structures for police and you have the introduction of more federal police and so even that is this kind of high-low versus middle uh, centralizing force um, where they use the uh, animus of Black Lives Matter and they use the stoking of this racial tension uh, to allow a greater centralization into a more federal centralized police force. And you're going to see more and more of this in, in the next few years. So, I mean, the myth of right-wing populism, the myth that... People are going to get so blackpilled, they're going to get so angry, they're going to turn on the news and they're going to see these riots every night and they're going to form God knows what and the country's going to split in two. This is real fancy thinking. It's not borne out by anything. I mean, you're just, at that point, you're just so caught up in the spectacle, you're so caught up in hyperpolitics that you're missing the wood from the trees. And Tim Pool is guilty of it. Tim Pool has, as I say, 30 videos on that. And lots of people are guilty of it. Um, but the right-wing populists especially fall into this. And it leads to, I think, very mistaken action, very mistaken thinking, but very mistaken action. And I think January 6th is a good example of that because, again, it's this ignoring of, okay, what are the, you know, what is the structure here? What is, what direction is this stuff going in? And it's just looking at the ground level, you know, people are mad. Uh, we've got all these people, they're mad as hell, and they're not going to take it anymore. And surely this has to lead to some kind of change. Surely this has to lead to some kind of revolution. And then what happens, you know, inevitably, the end of this kind of uh, online right-wing populism is you get a lot of people together, you get a lot of angry people, and someone says, okay, well, let's all go to this place on this date, and let's make loads of noise and from the ground up we'll create this huge change uh, and do right-wing populism and then you go there you know and you have you know again you have no factions on your side all you've got is is Donald Trump and he's kind of shown himself that he doesn't take the sides of his supporters that he doesn't really have the uh, the will or maybe the intelligence or cunning who knows to implement the kinds of changes that these people think he wants to 
implement. And so, you know, you go there and you have the whole apparatus of the intelligence services of the deep state of the media uh, ready for you to arrive weeks to prepare for this. And once you do that, you know, your pawns on a chessboard where the, the players, none of the players are on your side. And regardless of how big a crowd you get, or regardless of how uh, how fired up they are, or how good they look, how well presented they are, when you do that, you're no longer in control. Anyone can show up, infiltrators can be sent in. We've seen footage of the police uh, at Capitol Hill opening the doors to these protesters. And even if they didn't, even if they didn't, even if that's a conspiracy theory, even if that didn't happen, even if that footage was misleading, Theoretically, they could have, and that's something that you could forecast before that event. You could say, hey, uh, you know, we've got the whole system against us. The whole system wants to see us fail. The whole system wants to see people like us made illegal and thrown in jail and completely silenced. How would you use that event if you were an elite? You know, would you maybe let them in and let them smash some windows and um, uh, steal some stuff and have the politicians covered in fear and then use that as a pretext for another Patriot Act, use that uh, to be presented as a, another 9-11 or another Pearl Harbor, and again, use that to centralize power. Um, it's just another way for the state to kind of overreach and to use all these boogeymen, all these chimeras, uh, the specter of, of white supremacy to further their own interests. And if you know if the whole system if all of the elites have that goal in mind then really there isn't really a way to beat that there's no way around that anything you do is going to further that because you know fundamentally when you have all the media when you have complete narrative control uh, you can spend anything to your advantage as long as you have people out there as long as you have people out there uh, you can do this you know if no one showed up as no one showed up to the biden inauguration you can't really spin that into anything so it's this situation where it's like you know, you're in quicksand and the more you struggle, the more you sink into the quicksand and, you know, no action is good action in a certain sense, except for, you know, you start to keep with this analogy, you know, you start building something, you hook it on to something uh, outside the quicksand and you kind of, you know, you take the long approach and you build something that will um, give you some sort of independence from the system. But as long as you're in that and as long as you're struggling, within the confines that are set for you, you're going to be advancing um, your enemy's interests. And, you know, then you have people that are weeks later, and I'm seeing all of these commentators, all of these people that were promoting it, saying, well, obviously it was a setup, obviously it was a, a Fed operation, obviously this was, uh, this was planned by the Feds weeks, months in advance. And, you know, it's like, well, why didn't any of you see that coming? Why didn't anyone predict that? If you think that the deep state is so evil, if you think that the whole system is compromised, that all of these people are against conservatives, trying to destroy conservatives, well, why didn't you expect something like that to happen? Why would you put yourself at risk of that? And again, the problem is because they have this assumption of right-wing populism that, well, we have enough people we're going to organize, uh, there's going to be some kind of spontaneous thing and somehow we're going to get our way. And the right has this tendency to just fall into this trap again and again, no matter what it is. You know, anytime there's any kind of momentum for anything, it has to turn into, um, you know, it doesn't turn into the kind of positive action of, of community building, of trying to build things, uh, power structures, and hierarchies that are not controlled by the enemy, that have a certain independence and anti-fragility from the system, but it always has to turn into the hubris of let's punch the system in the nose and see if it punches back. And maybe this time it won't punch back uh, with a hundred times more ferocity and try and wipe us out like it did every other time. And inevitably it always does because again they're looking at historical examples, they're looking at case studies, and they're looking fundamentally at just this mythology that uh, this is what happens, that people take to the streets and the whole thing comes down and the good guys win in the end. Now, another example would be accelerationists and people that get blackpilled on this stuff and they say, oh, okay, I don't believe in any of this stuff and there's no political solution. 
So we're going to wait for collapse. Uh, maybe we're going to accelerate collapse. And then we will take power. Uh, then, you know, one day you open your curtains and there'll be militias on the streets and, you know, very soon we'll, we'll take back everything from the elites. But again, you look at popular revolutions and they happen at times of great modernization, great upheaval, where you have a central state uh, power, a, a despot that's very, uh, uh, very rigid, very reluctant to move with these changes to uh, integrate new elites. That's not at all what you have with collapse. What you have with collapse is something like, you know, you could look at the Soviet Union and really, I argue the Soviet Union was really a, a managed collapse. But again, what you have here, you have outside institutions, you have, um, you know, things like the Open Society Foundation, you have these foundations that are direct and capital into creating these protest movements, creating these color revolutions. But what you also have, and this is the problem, is a lot of the accelerationists seem to think that once things collapse that you're going to get this complete flattening out that, well, okay, right now we don't have much resources, we don't have any power really, but the people we hate have all of the power, they have all of the resources, so what will happen if there's, uh, if there's accelerationism into some kind of violent civil war is uh, there'll be a flattening effect and then they'll have they'll lose all their money and power and you know we didn't have much to begin with but it'll be just kind of flattening effect where the people at the bottom will be raised up and the people at the top will be uh, brought down or wiped out but what happens with collapse is the opposite of a popular revolution you know popular revolution comes in times of modernization what happens with collapse you look at the soviet union and you have oligarchs that just completely gobbled up the wealth of the Soviet Union. They used uh, collapse, they used the weakening of the state, they used the chaos of the time, you know, the hyperinflation, um, the political incompetence, the privatization campaigns done by corrupt politicians, often paid for by the same oligarchs. And they used this chaos to consolidate power, to seize the resources of the Soviet Union to take the oil, to take the minerals, to take the banking sector. And you get to the mid 90s and you have seven people that control 70% of the Russian economy. You get, you get these people like um, Roman Abramovich that come from nothing, that are uh, from a, a middle class or a poor background. And within a few years, they're multi-billionaires and some of the most powerful people in Russia because they've just uh, collected this stuff that was state-owned, that was collectively owned, and they've become billionaires out of it. So, I mean, Russia was carved up, it was divided up by these oligarchs, and there's no reason why that wouldn't be the case. I mean, if you look at collapse, what's going to happen in collapse? Well, it's not going to be this thing where overnight uh, everyone's bank accounts are wiped out, everyone's property is flattened, and we all kind of conglomerate in the center and it's back to tribalism. No, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a bit more gradual. The elites are going to see this happening. They'll probably see it happening before anyone. And because they have the wealth, because they have the power, because they have the institutions, because they have the connections, they're going to have ways to manipulate it, whether it's in the Soviet Union where they can just pay a corrupt finance minister to privatize the resources of the um, newly non-communist Russia and just hand over, hand over the resources to them. Or whether it's going to be what you saw last year with a crisis where you have small and medium businesses being wiped out and you have a consolidation of wealth by um, billionaire international oligarchs. And with this move to neo-feudalism, it just highlights this. You can have this kind of catabolic capitalism where you have things collapsing, you have environmental destruction, you have people getting poorer, you have much worse uh, conditions for the working class, you have people uh, owning less stuff, you have less homeowners, you have all this kind of stuff. Um, and the international elites, the oligarchs have such power that they can really manage this decline and they can 
use this kind of managerial capitalism to turn it into something other than the free market structures are in capitalism and they can gradually transition to neo-feudalism where their reign is much more managerial um, it's much less uh, fluid, much less dynamic and this is something that you could easily see happening You know, with the power they have now, you could easily see this happening at the time of a collapse and don't forget that these elites are so internationalist now, You know, they have their money hidden in, in offshore bank accounts, they can easily jump between countries within a matter of hours on flights. And that's another reason why, you know, one country collapses and it's very easy for them to hide out in um, the Cayman Islands or Bermuda or New Zealand or something else. And it's very easy for them to kind of manage that collapse from afar. So again, you get this kind of populist thinking with collapse you get this kind of populist thinking with accelerationism that again you'll make people so black pilled, people will get so cynical, racial conflict will get so bad that um, eventually there'll be some event that will trigger a collapse and all of this stuff will just boil up and you'll have the people from the ground up sort of seizing control of things, um, uh, instituting a kind of year zero, who knows. But again there's no reason to think this and when you move to collapse, you just have elites that already existed in the previous system um, becoming the elite of a new system. And, you know, there may be, again, there may be conflict between those elites that could sort of come to the fore in the time of a collapse. But again, what you find with the U.S. is it's less of a problem for the U.S. than most previous empires, because you have a, a, you have a capitalist elite that's tremendously united on, on social values and on the direction of things. That's, it's uniformly internationalist. And because America is not a, a nation that has this kind of embedded, uh, embedded capitalism, it doesn't have embedded elites, industrial elites, but what it is, is the seat of a financial empire. It's not so much a, an empire itself as it's the seat of an international financial empire. And that is what kind of gives it its strength in that it has no barriers to assimilating new elites because in virtue of their money power status, they become assimilated and the US becomes kind of their plaything rather than vice versa. And so there's never that conflict cropping up between the elite capitalist interests and the state interests and this is what separates the system from other countries like pre-revolution China where you had the potential for major social upheaval and for a mass popular movement um, you don't have this uh, sweeping wave of modernization that's going to destroy an older way of life uh, what you have is a system that's very much in keeping with the modernization that's pushing modernization and it has an elite that's constantly in flux um, with the direction of techno-capitalism and with modernization. So this is the, you know, this is the kind of the myth of, of right-wing populism. And I think it's very damaging because it crops up again and again. And you think people will learn lessons from things. You think people would learn lessons from things that happened in 2017, but then they do them in 2021. And you see this just time and time again, you know, you, what if, whether it's about the the lockdowns or whatever else, the lockdowns is another example, the, the tendency is always we'll, we'll do our best to kind of insert ourselves into the discourse and black pill as many conservatives as possible and then when we have enough conservatives we will uh, take to the streets and we'll all show up in one place and we'll make a lot of noise and you know maybe some people will uh, attack the police officers or Maybe some people will do very, um, they'll do things that make us look very bad, or maybe there'll be some infiltrators. Maybe the security services will set us up, but uh, you know maybe we can spin the narrative after that and tell everyone it was a setup and try and uh, try and get to the public before the mainstream media and and tell them our side of the story. And it never works because it can't work because you're not going to outsmart the entire apparatus of the deep state and the entire apparatus that has been assembled by the oligarchs to keep the system moving. And at a certain point you have to accept that it's so anti-fragile that any action like that isn't going to really leave a dent in things. 
And, you know, people complain about black pilling, but I think this kind of black pilling is necessary at some point because this is the kind of thinking that keeps people in the spectacle. And Tim Pool's job is to keep you in the spectacle. Tim Pool's job is to get views on his videos. I mean, that's all he cares about. He doesn't really have any beliefs. His thing is that, oh, I was a liberal and the Democrats went too far, so now I criticize the Democrats. That's the same shtick as, as Dave Rubin. Uh, that is the you know, that is the way to uh, get views and not get banned off anything and be kind of acceptable to everyone and not really have any strong beliefs and not be a radical, not be an ideologue, but just be a guy that's there for clicks and fame and popularity. And that's the formula that these guys follow. And that's why they're always pushing people back onto the merry-go-round of this narrative of right-wing populism. And you know what really shows the effects of this is just take a step back and look at how stable things are. You know things seem particularly polarized. You know they're cancelled doctors, they're cancelling Dr. Seuss books. Everyone hates each other. But you just had an election in the U.S. where you had a one guy that ran on a like Jeb Bush 2016 political platform, a typical Republican platform. And then you had the guy that was vice president in 2008. So, I mean, this was an election in the US that could have taken place in any other year. It could have been uh, the 2000 election in terms of their, their fundamental policies, in terms of where they're coming from. So as much as you have all these radicals, you have the Voshes popping up and you have everyone is identifying as an anarcho-communist and anarcho-syndicalist and you have fascists popping up and you have all of this radicalism that's developed in the last few years. You have this polarization paradox where everyone is going way, way out to the left and the right. And the center is more stable than ever. You, know, you can't even get Bernie Sanders as the Democrat candidate or you can't get a you can't get a, you can't get Trump to maintain a kind of nationalist platform. And I think what does this is people are going out so far to the extremes. But this polarization, it doesn't create fundamental change because what it does is it brings people back into the spectacle and it's the fear of the other that drives this stuff forward which is like well I may be an anarcho-communist and I may think Biden is a capitalist shill and a warmonger but Trump is a racist and Trump said really nasty mean things and he seems like a uh, fascist and um, I've seen you know him say lots of horrible nasty stuff on the news and so on so although I'm an anarcho-communist, I'm going to hold my nose, I'm going to vote for this guy that's, um, that, you know, pushed these foreign wars and is a complete neoliberal in his economics, I'm going to have to vote for him because the other guy is so terrible. And, you know, you have right-wingers and you have, like, nationalists in the U.S. that say, well, Trump was a disaster, they criticized him for four years, you know, he betrayed us and everything. But, you know, at the same time, there's this kind of, inevitable logic to it there's this inevitable logic to polarization where well you know our side is bad but the other side is absolutely terrible so you know i'm gonna have to vote for trump on this one so the system can tolerate this extreme radicalism uh it can tolerate extreme polarization and polarization even has a stabilizing effect so tim pool is wrong you know the elites aren't uh expecting that this polarization is going to create a, a civil war they're not scared of that and probably rightly so and, you know, polarization and people being really angry at the blue team and really angry at the red team is not the stuff that fundamental political upheavals and a civil war of the scope and magnitude capable of destroying the um, unipolar hegemon, the most powerful empire to ever exist. Uh, that's not going to happen. That's really uh, fancy thinking. But again, this shows you what the point of the spectacle is, the point of hyperpolitics. It's making people impotent because while they're watching the spectacle, while they're expecting the civil war to start any day, they're not getting their lives together. They're not building their own communities. They're not making real life contacts. They're not creating things that could survive some kind of collapse. Um, and they're not doing things to further the interests of their group within the system because they're so focused on the spectacle, they're so focused on the urgency. And I make this video now because the trial of Derek Chauvin is this year, and I think you'll see all of this again in the summer, because 
looking back at those predictions, you just see that this stuff is endless. People never learn. There are people that have been making these predictions and doing this stuff, doing the conservative carousel stuff, the right-wing populism stuff for 30 years, and they'll keep doing it. And it's going to happen again with this trial. There's going to be riots. There's going to be looting. There's going to be stores burned down. There's going to be police cars burned out. And um, if you pull right-wingers on it, they'll all say that it's going to be civil war and that this is the end of America and there will be a, a revolution in, you know, by the end of the year. Um, and it won't happen. It'll all be forgotten about by October again uh, or whenever the Democrats, whenever the elites decide to end it. Because, frankly, you know, you look at, you can look at a case like the, you know, when George H.W. Bush was president and he ended race riots very quickly. Uh, you know, it might seem like the, the state apparatus is very weak now because you're constantly seeing riots and upheaval and they're allowing this stuff to go on. But fundamentally, if they decided to end these riots, if they decided that in the summer and if they used the military and the police force, uh, a disorganized group of, of looters that don't really have any political idealism and are just there for destruction, they're not going to make any kind of dent or they're not going to be able to do anything up against um, a, an organized centralized military force. So there may actually be less riot in this year if they decide to, to end it early. But at the same time, even if it goes on, even if they decide to let it happen, if they don't want to uh, cause any more grief by, by causing any more casualties or whatever, People will get caught up in this stuff again. You'll have another couple of months of, of people uh, predicting the worst, um, but it's not going to happen. And nothing fundamentally is ever going to change by thinking you can sort of reset the system by um, black people and conservatives or by kind of cheering on polarization from your Twitter account, you know, and you know, that's not real politics. And I think real politics is uh, community building. Real politics is things that translate into real life. And if the right wants to stop failing, it's going to have to start looking at how its actions translate into the real world and into real life and start separating that from the spectacle stuff. So that's about all. Um, Thanks for watching, subscribe, hit the bell, all that good stuff, and thanks for your time.